of why we were interested in talking with you. And um, then after this uh, short uh, uh, introduction of, of you and your book, we might go to, you can uh, elaborate a, a little on, on the book and the themes and why you think it's important. And um, then I have some, some questions. I have been giving it some thought about this theme about a science of connection, like a, a basic theme in, in mental health. And, uh, and then we will move uh, in the last part more to uh, the psychopharmacology uh, of MDMA and, and why it is, has such a therapeutic potential and the difference and the similarities to classical psychedelics. And uh, I think Jesper will also have a lot to say there. And he will also, whenever there might be uh, something he can also contribute with. Would that be okay? I, I just uh, sure. Um, yeah. Would you you want me to introduce myself? You sort of saying I should start with what what you know about me and then add I, I, what I, I what know. I know about me. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I can make maybe. some assumptions. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know you are a clinical psychiatrist and you are specialized in psycho uh, pharmacology and you're very interested. In, the, in, the, in how drugs affect us, the, the ones generated internally and the one we use recreationally are therapeutic. And you, you have uh, extensive uh, experience in the, in the front lines of psychiatry. You wrote this book, uh, Weekend uh, at, at Bellevue, where this uh, big uh, hospital in, in, uh, in the New York area, as, as far as I understood, where you had this night shift and you really been, I say, in the front lines of intensive uh, psychiatric care and then you also have a, a private practice and as uh, as i understand you also incorporate uh, you might say holistic approaches you have this page natural mood uh, you go into food and sex life and people's social life stuff like that and you also wrote this uh, book uh, moody bitches where you also talk a lot about uh, yeah, the natural mood and, and, and what is uh, pathological and when should you medicate and then where do you have other strategies? And then I know you have done this book, uh, The Complete Guide to Ecstasy, it's uh, uh, quite some years ago, was I think one of the first really major books on ecstasy that, that I know anyway. And also uh, you have done the pot book also, also uh, as an editor, I think, and you have done a research research in the psychosis and schizophrenia, which also is very interesting. And, and then, of course, in, in the field of uh, MDMA-assisted therapy, uh, you have uh, extensive experience. And, uh, you know, uh, here in the network, we, we, we are uh, five or seven psychologists. We're going to New York soon to do the MAPS training. Oh, good. Yeah. So, so we feel a little, in the Danish context, we feel a little like first movers in this area, but but uh, I mean, compared to you, you discovered uh, MDMA assisted therapy. I mean, in the middle of the eighties or something like that, as an undergraduate, right? So yeah. that you have been in the field. Uh, wow, you know, actually, yeah. you know a lot about me. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a pretty thorough introduction. Um, sure. Let's let me see if I can find things you didn't know. So okay. you're right. I did. I did learn about MDMA in 1985, mm. and um, I was an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was studying this great major called the Biological Basis of Behavior. That was a really uh, just like an amalgam of of neurology and biology and psychology and pharmacology. Um, and I literally took like every class in the major. I spent my summers at Penn taking more classes. I was very interested in this stuff because uh, in my teenage years, I was a, sort of a, a natural drug researcher. I would try things and take notes and see how long things lasted and write it all down. And, you know, I, uh, how, you know, what milligrams and what my experience was. So I, from a young age, I was really fascinated by how um, chemicals could change our perception and our behavior. And uh, I inadvertently, uh, when I was 15, uh, I was trying to experience mescaline, but I ended up experiencing PCP, fencyclidin, which um, gave me like a pretty solid psychotic experience. I really got to experience um, 
referential ideation and uh, pretty intense uh, just paranoia and visual hallucinations. So uh, I got very interested in two things right after that. Uh, one was I got very interested in psychosis and what it was all about and the pharmacology of it. Um, but the other is I got interested in, in harm reduction and drug policy because I was, even as a 15 year old, I was, I was angry and sort of indignant. Uh, if I wanna see what mescaline is like, I should be able to see what mescaline is like. I shouldn't end up with PCP. So I got very interested in you know, counterfeit drug, drug substitution. Uh, how could this happen? Why, why can't I just you know, go to a store and get the thing I wanna try? And so uh, from my teenage years, I was interested in harm reduction and uh, when I got to Penn, I got very interested in um, needle exchange and supervised injection sites and things like that, which was was very early for this kind of thing. I mean, my my professors would ridicule me. This was early early HIV years, and I was like, you know, we should be giving out condoms, we should be giving out clean needles, and my professors were like, you're crazy, and I was right. <laughs> and so it was during that time in 1985 that I learned about MDMA. And um, I was I was thrilled because it was the first time there was a new drug. You know, I had I had either tried them all or learned about them all as far as I knew. So it was very exciting to be studying psychopharmacology and there was a new drug and not only a new drug, but one that was being used during psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I sort of got this idea of drug assisted psychotherapy was learning about MDMA and how it was being used in the 70s and early 80s in the United States. So I ended up writing my first book was a, was, it's a nonprofit book to fund MDMA research, but that's, that's Ecstasy, the Complete Guide. And for about 20 something years, I've been the medical monitor for a lot of the MAPS, MDMA, PTSD studies. Um, as they got bigger and boy, they have grown. <laughs> um, <laughs> the the phase three trials became like these multi-center trials all over the place and it was getting less fun to be a medical monitor and a lot more uh long boring meetings and paperwork so now i'm just the medical advisor to maps which is so yeah. much better Perfect. really good for me Sounds um good. but uh you know it's that um between cannabis and MDMA, MAPS kept me busy. I mean, I was the medical monitor for the cannabis PTSD study also, which did not fare very well because we had very poor quality study drug that our government gave us some pretty terrible mm -hmm. looking cannabis to try to use in human studies. And um, our results were pretty equivocal as one might imagine, given the quality of our study drug. Um, so yes, my most recent book is called Good Chemistry. Yeah. Um, and it's coming out in paperback this summer. And uh, the subtitle is The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics. And um, that subtitle actually was the idea of my husband, Jeremy. And I was a little uncomfortable to put the word soul on the cover of a book. I really had to be convinced because mm -hmm. the book that I wrote wasn't really uh, very soulful it was very biological um and I had to kind of work in that idea a little bit because it wasn't totally present and really uh I think if there are any psychiatrists in the audience I think they can sort of commiserate that you know we're not usually ones to speak about the soul with our patients and it's a little you know if I was talking to a patient I would say something like you know what feeds your soul and I would you know put these up so I wouldn't get in trouble. But I did honestly have a patient once really kind of yell at me about using the word soul. You know, she thinks her, her priest can use that word, but her mm -hmm. psychiatrist should not be using that word. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then again, I don't shy away from uh, book titles that are a little bit um, off-putting like Moody Bitches, uh, no. which was really a very uh, tongue in cheek way of trying to get women's attention. Um, but this, uh... Mm -hmm. So the, the subtitle of Moody Bitches is um, the truth about the, the drugs you're taking, the sleep you're missing, the sex you're not having, and what's really making you feel crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and toward the end of Moody Bitches, what I talked about why people feel crazy is that really the, it's, it be, it's basically because of this disconnection 
that people are sort of not connected with their own bodies because they're they're just sort of living in a fantasy world on their phone or their laptop um, and people not being very connected with nature uh, or um, with their families, with their partners, with their communities, um, or with the cosmos. And so um, good chemistry really took, took the ending of Moody Bitches and made it its own book. You know, how can we focus more on this issue of disconnection and connection? And, you know, good chemistry was written before COVID. And I was writing about an epidemic. I was writing about this epidemic of isolation and loneliness and individualism that I have to say is much more rampant in, in uh, our culture, I think, than in yours. Um, but, you know, there's something in, in the United States about uh, not being very united, being very kind of go it alone, rugged cowboy, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Um, and, you know, it's not very communal or social. And, you know, there's a real schism right now in our country between people who would like it to be more communal and social and people who don't. Um, so uh, one of the points of, of good chemistry is really that like we as, as humans, you know, we are categorized as obligatorily gregarious. We are supposed to be social. And if we're not social, we're not gonna survive. So good chemistry is really about sort of confronting this, this illusion of individualism, this illusion of separation. You know, anyone, any one of us who has had a, a, a mystical psychedelic experience knows on a really deep level that separation is an illusion, that everything is interconnected. And, you know, at the peak of a psychedelic experience, it's you are jacked in, you are connected into the thing that is very connected. And that's a really euphoric place to be. Um, and a lot of us, you know, come back from that mystical experience with this sort of lesson or, you know, this deep knowing, this, this noetic experience, you know, that we have touched on something and, and that the epiphany is that we're all interconnected and, you know, and that love connects us or whatever you want to call this sort of unifying energy, you know, mm. this like uh, lattice work, you know, that everyone is sort of jacked into. Um, so I was trying to, I was trying to explain that in a book, mm. you know, without sounding like a lunatic. So mm. I, I did talk quite a bit of, uh, about sort of the pharmacology of feeling connected and the, and the bliss and the joy and where that comes from. You know, the title good chemistry is really about uh, what makes us feel good? What, you know, what are the behaviors that make us feel good? What is the pharmacology that sort of undergirds those good feelings? And, and how do we get them in, in lots of other ways that, that uh, include psychedelics and, and sort of psychedelic adjacent experiences, um, but also adjacent to those plant medicines and fungus, things like chanting and dancing and and hugging, um, you know, or, or playing with our pets, you know, there's just, there's all sorts of ways that we can sort of generate that good chemistry um, and feel connected, um, including just being connected to ourselves and our own intuition and our own desires. So I'll stop talking for a minute. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. I think it's a very timely and a very great book and actually, uh, uh, when, when I have clients or with, when if I talk to people who are interested in psychedelic therapy I, who, are, who are not uh, professionals, I say a, a good introduction is Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind. But if you want the female companion, MDMA-informed companion, then you read your book, Good Chemistry. Because I think in a sense, uh, Michael Pollan's book is How to Change Your Mind, but yours is How to Care and Connect. So they supplement each other uh, very well, nice. It's funny because when, um, so Michael and I have become friends over the years. Um, I, I actually interviewed him for the pot book um, a long time ago and we stayed in touch and he interviewed me for that, that early New Yorker piece that he did the trip treatment. And when he was here working on the New Yorker piece, my, Jeremy and I were like, you should write a book. Are you going to write a book? You know, you've got a lot there. And he decided he did want to write a, write a book, but he didn't want to include MDMA in the book. He wanted to stay focused 
um, on things he had tried. And, you know, he felt like MDMA isn't like a classical psychedelic, which is true. And I was like, good. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad that you're not writing about MDMA because I, I can do that more in my book. And I know that there won't be any overlap. And every once in a while I would email Michael and I'd be like, are you writing about oxytocin? And he's like, you know, no, I'm not really, you know, should I? And I was like, no, I, you know, I want to write about, and then I would email him like, are you writing about neuroplasticity? And he's like, I don't think it's that important. And I was like, I, you know, I really want to write about that. So that's good. And then I'm like, are you writing about orgasms? And he's like, what are you <laughs> writing? What is this book? <laughs> but so, but that that is the kind of thing you discuss, right? You you discuss yeah. But so it is. It's true that it 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 is a compliment to his book. There's not a lot of redundancy between his book and my book. And the other thing is, and I I have no notes, no criticism for him at all. I really have so much respect for all of his books and his whole body of work is very impressive. And he's like a, he's a good person. He's a mensch. But some women complained that there weren't a lot of women featured in his books. And it was, you know, all the usual white guys who get interviewed a lot. So um, I, it was really important to me to try to feature more women scientists um, and women of color and just uh, people who maybe don't always get the same level of attention on documentaries and podcasts, but they're working, they've been working in the field for decades. So um, if you, when you read Good Chemistry, you'll notice that it's a little bit skewed toward women scientists and women researchers. And that was just because I wanted to balance out, you know, what was already out there. Yeah, but, but also uh, I think, yeah, I think they're really nice together, actually, as you yeah. say, these two books. So that's a great thing. But, but, but actually, I think uh, Michael's book is, is a great book, but, but also it is, a, it is somewhat lacking uh, uh, that he's not discussing MDMA, but then of course people can read your book. But but I, I think uh, as as an introduction to the new psychedelic research and the psychedelic renaissance, it's it's just so important that it's a, it's a major difference that we have MDMA right now, and 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 it was only about the classical psychedelics in the sixties. I think that's a a major yeah. Difference. Well, I'll tell you. So I'm you know. Uh, I'm an undergraduate at University of Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm planning on being a psychiatrist. I'm majoring in psychopharmacology and I learned about this drug MDMA and it felt like magic to me. It was just the right place, the right time. You know, I couldn't design a chemical to accompany psychotherapy like as well as MDMA is. You know, you've got the, you've got the methamphetamine base. So people are awake, alert, very focused. They want to talk. <laughs> They're a little chatty. They want to connect. You know, back in the back in the '90s, sometimes if we really were trying to have an intense interview with a psychiatric patient, sometimes we would do what's called an amitol interview, which is kind of like getting somebody drunk and they'll tell you their secrets. You know, but the thing about amitol is it's incredibly sedating, and so it's like you're like, hey, wake up. You know, we have to process your trauma, but they're like you know, falling asleep. It was, it was very uh, unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. So now you have, you have sort of a stimulant that is going to allow somebody to have very good focus and uh, memory and, you know, not only memory for the trauma, but memory for the therapy session, which is really important, right? Because sometimes uh, say something like uh, nitrous oxide or even ketamine, you know, you think you've got these epiphanies, but when you start to come out of it, you just don't really, you know, it's like sand through your fingers. You mm. can't quite grasp it. But with MDMA, because of that methamphetamine base, you're, you're just, uh, it's almost like you've taken an ADD medicine. You know, you've, you're focused, you've got good concentration, you've got good memory retrieval, memory processing. So that's number one. Number two, you've got this massive influx of serotonin so that you're not anxious. And there's a sense of satiety, you know, you don't have a lot of angst, you're just kind of comfortable. Um, and that combination of serotonin dopamine really also, I think, gives you just sort of strength and confidence to actually look at your trauma. But you also have massively increased amounts of oxytocin with MDMA. So um, that quiets down the amygdala, right? One of the things that oxytocin does is it, is it can really uh, lower the, the fear response and the way that you sort of interpret social cues. So everything looks a little rosier and safer, but when you're looking through your trauma, it's great that your amygdala is quiet because then you're not getting this huge sympathetic charge that you typically get 
when you start to look at your trauma, you know, um, the, one of the things I explain a lot in good chemistry is the difference between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous mm -hmm. system. And so everybody knows about sympathetic, right? We've been taught this forever, fight or flight. That's the key to survival. You have to either be able to attack or evade. And I, you know, it may be that 5% of your life, you actually have to beat up somebody or run away. But the truth is like 95% of your life, you have to be able to actually stay and negotiate uh, and not get into a fight and, and not run away. So um, the opposite of sympathetic is parasympathetic. So as much as the sympathetic runs on like cortisol and adrenaline, the parasympathetic really runs on oxytocin. That is the thing that allows us to rest, digest and repair. And some people also call it uh, tend and befriend. Um, please and appease, <laughs> there's all sorts of, but the I care and connect, the idea is that you're not fighting, you're not running away, you're building relationships, you're repairing your relationships, but it is in this parasympathetic state that we can sleep, digest our food, have a good metabolism, have a good immune system, mm. and also bodily repair. You know, oxytocin helps with wound healing, and the only time your body really fixes itself <clears throat> it's not when you're in fight or flight. That is when you're running on empty and there's no repair going on. Parasympathetic is when you do the repair. So when MDMA increases oxytocin, it puts you into this parasympathetic fix it sort of place. Um, you can start to mend your relationships with yourself, with your trauma, with your partners, and very importantly, with your therapist, right? All that oxytocin sort of bleeds over into you trust the therapist, you're bonding with a the therapist. Um, and, you know, a therapeutic alliance is one of the main indicators of whether psychotherapy is going to be mm -hmm. successful or not. So a medicine that enhances therapeutic alliance, you know, chef's yeah. kiss, that's just like, that's like the icing on the cake, you know? <laughs> so between the dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, you've got just lots of good things that, that are putting the brain, um, and the body in, in a very open state to process the trauma, to integrate the trauma, to accept the narrative, make sense of the narrative, you know, and that, and the making sense of narrative is sort of where it is a little bit more like a psychedelic, because I talk about this idea of seeing the macro, pulling out and seeing the big picture. When you're playing a video game, if you, if you can see a map of the whole game board, you're really at an advantage, you know, otherwise you're stuck going around in circles. You don't even realize there's a whole other piece of the board. So I feel like MDMA can really help you to sort of see the big picture, the macro, mm -hmm. how the trauma fits into the whole narrative, you know, making sense of something bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that macro does help you integrate it, right? I mean, maybe you can't make sense of this terrible thing that happened, but in, in the whole scheme of things, you can make a place for it. So changing your perspective, widening the lens, you're going to get that with, with most psychedelic experiences. And it's an incredible, it's a valuable piece of it. Sure. And then I think it's just a great strategy for MAPS to sort of uh, make the foundation of the paradigm of psychedelic therapy with MDMA, because it's probably easier to work with, right? Uh, and, it, and it had so many uh, applications on many, many different things because uh, this thing about this uh, therapeutic safe space or the therapeutic alliance and, 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 and people being able to uh, uh, contain their own emotions and, and show who they really are, it's, it's, uh, it's such, just such a basic thing in, 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 uh, in mental health. I like that therapeutic safe space. I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Um, I remember the first time I ever took MDMA, uh, I was alone, you know, with a pen, pen and paper, which was how I like to do things back then. Um, but I, I was amazed at how quiet my head was. Yeah, exactly. The whole room was just quiet, but I felt like I could bring anything into the room, you know, to calmly analyze it. Um, so that I like that safe space therapeutically. I do. I agree that uh, MDMA is really versatile. It's, I think it's safe to say whatever could be treated through psychotherapy can probably be treated with MDMA assisted psychotherapy more efficiently, you know, yeah. more 
perhaps more quickly, probably more effectively. Yeah. So that, that opens it up to many diagnoses. And the other thing I say about psychedelics a lot is that they really are transdiagnostic, you know, because you're not talking about treating obsessive compulsive disorder or treating post-traumatic stress disorder or treating addiction. What you're really, the way I think about it is you're really focusing on cognitive rigidity, right? What do these three things have in common? Like if you're anorectic, no one can convince you that you're not thin enough. And if you have OCD, you're convinced that, you know, contamination is something that you need to totally focus on. And if you do these seven things, then you won't get contaminated. And, and addiction is sort of focusing on, you know, this is the one substance that's going to make me feel okay. And in all of those syndromes, cognitive rigidity is what is propagating the, the illness and the symptoms. So to, to undergo to ingest something that enables cognitive flexibility, that enables you to think there may be another way, there may be another perspective, there may be a bigger perspective. Um, you know, we know that psilocybin absolutely enhances cognitive flexibility, right? Looseness of associations. Um, sometimes if, when people are really peaking on mushrooms, they look a little bit hypomanic, you know, they're, they're making these sort of leaps, these looseness of associations that you would see in somebody who is hypomanic or manic. Um, but that loosening can be really therapeutic, you know, people get very stuck in ways of thinking. And that's also where this idea of, of neuroplasticity, I think, complements cognitive flexibility, right? That, that the brain is sort of, now I'm going to definitely use air quotes here. Like the brain is like, you know, reorganizing its circuitry or um, rewiring itself. Like, you know, I think this is just the way we're thinking about it. These are metaphors, but on a molecular level, there are new connections being made, right? There's synaptogenesis, there's neurogenesis, you know, we're getting new brain cells, new connections. And on a macro level, parts of the brain that didn't really communicate much finally get a chance to check in with each other. Um, and parts of the brain that are always kind of going, you know, how am I doing? Uh, the, you know, the sort of, I guess the sort well, of, you, could, you know, the default mode network, you could think about it as sort of being like the, um, like a self-analysis, self-centered, um, I, me, mine, you know, where, how am I doing? What do I need to do tomorrow? How, you know, where do I stand socially? It's just all this stuff about yourself. And when that circuitry quiets down, other things have a chance to come up and other connections and parts of the brain get to communicate. And so, you know, we're seeing more and more of this research, animal research, human research, that's really reinforcing this idea of um, increased connections within the brain. I wanted to ask you, Julie, because um, I very much agree with what you just said about cognitive flexibility as an <clears throat> overarching theme or a common denominator when it comes to treating psychiatric disturbances and the rigidity that often follows. So that's, uh, I, I guess, a hallmark of the, or a, a key characteristic of the psychedelic experience, which is very much attributable or dependent uh, on serotonin 2A receptor agonism with MDMA. There is more like a general like release of serotonin stimulating all serotonin receptors. We know that serotonin 1A receptors have much higher affinity and they have this calming effect. And the 5 t 2 a effect is sort of more subtle, although more recently it was found that of the two halves, the two mirror images of MDMA, the, the R and the S in the N2 mirrors, that one of them actually acts as a weak serotonin 2A receptor agonist. So it has this weak uh, or modest psychedelic like um effect yeah i think contributes but uh, i was just wondering what your thoughts are on on uh, the cognitive flexibility when it comes to mdma because it has this pro-social effect the, the classical psychedelics do not have to the same degree maybe low doses do but at right. the, you know the heroic doses of psychedelics people typically go inside like it's right. more in introspective whereas mdma is also really very outward directed so i was wondering how much do you think of the therapeutic as or therapeutic effects of MDMA, whether it's yeah, what MDMA facilitated psychotherapy or just the effect of MDMA, how much of that do you think is attributable to the 
I mean, like a, a loosening of the mind, an improvement in cognitive flexibility, and how much of it is due to the the connection that is being established due to oxytocin. And mentioning that, actually, more recently, it was also found that some of the psychedelics, like LSD and psilocybin, also increase oxytocin levels. So they, yeah, you know, so it's, it's not as as um, you know, not as much. Normal. But I think so. You know. I think when I'm talking about the cognitive flexibility stuff, I am sort of thinking more about the classical psychedelics than MDMA. It's true, all of the classical psychedelics do agonize 5-HT2A and MDMA does that much less than the classical psychedelics do. And it's true that S and R differ in how much they hit 2A. Um, and it's true that they hit 1A more, which is, you know, some people call that like a serenic because it helps you, helps you feel serene and calm. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a, it's a tremendous boon to a therapist um, if somebody can feel serene and calm while they're unpacking, you know, the worst trauma of their lives. So, I mean, the 1A does make it unique. But in terms of oxytocin and 5-HT2A and, and classical psychedelics, MDMA, I would say, and I don't have numbers to back this up, but I, th I think it's pretty clear that MDMA increases oxytocin more than the classical psychedelics do. But one of the reasons that the classical psychedelics do is that when you, when you stimulate 5-H2A enough, um, it actually, uh, there's, there are, how can I put this? Oxytocin receptors and 5-HT2A receptors can create a dimer like a receptor, uh, a receptor complex, right? And it's called a heterodimer because it's two different things. Um, you can get homodimers where you get two oxytocin receptors that complex, but 2A, serotonin 2A and oxytocin receptors can form dimers. And so therefore you're gonna get crosstalk. If you get enough 5-HT2A stimulation, you're gonna get crosstalk over to oxytocin. Um, but I really think that MDMA directly increases oxytocin and also um, vasopressin more than the classical ones do. But I think you're right that the cognitive flexibility really does to me come more with the 2A um, stimulation, but you, you're gonna see neuroplasticity with all of these things. And the other thing to remember, not so much MDMA, but definitely some of the psychedelics are also anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. which is a whole other reason to maybe consider microdosing. Um, although I, you know, I encourage just uh, the cannabis family for anti-inflammatory. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to go. What you just said about the heterodimer formation and, and uh, like interaction between oxytocin and serotonin 2A receptors uh, brings me to the, another question I, I also wanted to hear your thoughts on, and that's the the phenomenon that in, um, in recreational uh, settings are called candy flipping, where people combine MDMA with classical psychedelics like psilocybin. Um, and I think from a pharmacological point of view, it makes sense to, to have the, the calming, soothing effect of MDMA, this like safe space, emotional safe space, and then expand on the more sort of psychedelic aspects of it by adding on say psilocybin or another classical psychedelic or alternatively use, um, let's say we could have, it's, instead of using the racemic mix of MDMA, which is I guess a 50-50 mix of the two enantiomers, if you could have more of the R enantiomer to get more of that serotonin effect and the oxytocin love and trust effect and somewhat less of the of the S enantiomer that brings the dopamine and norepinephrine and the vigilance arousal and all that energy, that would be another way to, I guess, possibly um, arrive at the same um, end point as just using standard MDMA plus a bit of a psychedelic. But I'm, I'm just curious as to what you think about doing that combination to harvest yeah. uh, maximally from both of them at the same time. Well, it's funny because you say, you know, in a recreational, uh situation people are candy flipping but the truth is that there's a lot of uh clinical research looking at that and um you know how there's tons of companies now i mean if you don't know i will tell you <laughs> there are tons of companies who are uh looking at psychedelics various blends of psychedelics you know proprietary like you could get somebody who is having a proprietary blend of R and S or like the R comes early and the S comes later or vice versa. 
Um, but there, there are definitely companies that are looking at combining MDMA and LSD, um, MDMA and psilocybin. So all, all those things are happening. And, and certainly underground therapists more and more are using combinations. And actually I'm, you know, the purist in me, uh, I just, I just feel like, uh, it's, there's a, a lot fewer variables if you can do one thing at a time, you mm -hmm. know? So what I don't like is an underground therapist who's starting with two, two things. I think mm -hmm. that it's good to have one experience with one thing, get the lay of the land, have another experience with the other thing, get the lay of that land. And then if you do want to combine them down the line, now, you know, the person can tolerate this and tolerate that. So probably the two together, but like just right off the bat, you know, doing candy flipping for underground therapy, I think is just a little too. Uh, it has to be done rationally and systematically yeah. and cautiously. What, what I hear is the, mm -hmm. that, that for my clients who has tried that, 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 that many of the underground therapists, they start with MDMA and then go to psilocybin and then maybe it mix. And, 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 but is it safe to combine a psilocybin and, uh, and MDMA or can you get a serotonin shock or something like that? Well, there, we have seen people safely combine MDMA and LSD, and we have seen people safely combine MDMA and, and psilocybin. So I think um, anecdotally and even clinically, it seems like uh, these these are combinations that people tolerate. Um, I'm If you notice, I'm not saying the word safe because <laughs> it's very loaded. You know, you could say safer, or let, you know, it's like... Um, I think it's important here to mention that combining MDMA and ayahuasca would not be wise to do right. that. Right. Uh, I would say combining anything with ayahuasca is not good. And, um, and you know, that brings me actually to an issue that I, I when we get to Q&A, if anybody has any information on this, this is a question I like to ask my audience is I'm always looking for information about drug interactions that are safe or unsafe or safer and less safe. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that when it comes to ayahuasca, um, there are so many things that you can't take with ayahuasca. You know, it's almost easier to say the things you can, uh, but you but you can't take, you know, antidepressants or uh, stimulants or dextromethorphan, cough syrup, opiates. There, there are many, many things that are not safe to take with ayahuasca, and that's because of the MAO inhibitor within the ayahuasca brew. Um, but when it comes to psilocybin, there aren't that many things that are really unsafe to take with it. It's just that they may modify the experience. They may make it more intense or less intense. Um, same thing with LSD. So, um, and then you have something like ketamine that actually pretty much plays well with others. And, and you know, one of the things, uh, say what you will about ketamine, but, but like one of the good things is you don't have to stop your psychiatric medicines to have a ketamine experience you know, um, it's hard to get off psych meds. It's pretty challenging. There are certain antidepressants that are really difficult to get off of, and you really need somebody to help you uh, do a very slow taper. Sometimes you have to add a different medicine and then do the taper and then taper the second medicine, uh, which allowed you to get off the first medicine. It's It can be pretty complicated. And also if somebody's been on antidepressants for a long time and they come off, they don't feel very good. Um, and then you're giving them this intense psychedelic experience where maybe uh, they're going to uncover trauma they didn't know they have, and they're going to be in a place where they need even more support afterwards. So it's just that double whammy of coming off medicines and having a pretty intense trauma to process where, where that can be unsafe, you know, um, people could be in a very vulnerable place then. So that, that is something that happens every once in a while, um, it, you know, within the underground is people getting off their meds so they can have this experience. And then they're really just like uncovered, you know, and unsupported. So, uh, you know, integration can help to prevent that sort of vulnerable place where after the session, people need a lot of support. Um, you know, there's some people have, have had sort of earth shattering revelations that really need to be processed slowly and carefully. That's why also uh, in the ne network, we're also trying to get more the uh, uh, psych uh, psychological and psychotherapeutic uh, aspects with, because uh, sometimes it's talked about like, uh, you can take this miracle drug and it can reset your brain. And then 
then you'll be good. But but then people are not prepared to to uh, all this uh, material, all this confrontation with the unconscious, as it, you were saying, Jungian terms, that it really is, and it can yeah. be a process really of integration, right? You know. The other thing is it can be a huge disappointment, right? The, it, these things get so hyped up and sometimes people have tried a lot of different therapies and they're finally trying this one thing that everybody says is going to work. And for whatever reason, it doesn't work. And then, you know, there's tremendous disappointment there too, because it's like, what's, what's wrong with me? You know, why everybody has this great bliss. You know, I have a patient who, you know, keeps sort of coming back to me saying how disappointed she is because she's not getting the bliss, you know, other people get bliss, I'm not getting bliss. And it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so, there's a lot in the in the popular literature now about, you know, how, how effective and efficient these treatments are, but there's always gonna be people who don't respond. Um, or, you know, one of the things that we, uh, I hate talking about this, it's really upsets me, but um, we took, all the people who had been given MDMA clinically, and we divided them into two groups, people who had to come off their SSRI antidepressants and people who didn't. And the ones who had come off SSRIs before their MDMA treatment, they did not have a very robust response, not psychologically, not physiologically. You know, they didn't have the little increase in heart rate and blood pressure. Like they just, they had a very muted response, but they were off their meds. So the question, the fear is, is it possible that there's a subset of people who've been on antidepressants so long, they're not going to respond to MDMA? And if that's true, do they respond to psilocybin or LSD or mescaline? You know, people don't talk about mescaline very much, and I don't know why. Um, I mean, you know, I get that peyote is scarce and needs to be protected. And everybody needs to understand that. Like it takes 20 years for those cactus to grow and, the, you know, to mature to the buttons. It's not sustainable. But um, San Pedro cactus grows very quickly. And there's there are other things that have mescaline um, in them, other cacti and, um, and also sy synthetic. I guess mescaline. You... So, and I'm just, I'm just sort of adding, I want to add mescaline back into the conversation because uh, you can microdose with it. You can macrodose. And if you are one of these people, like I have some patients who are just like, I don't know, mushrooms aren't for me. I don't like the way they feel. And I'm like, you know, if, if one didn't respond well to the fungus kingdom, one might look at the cactus kingdom and maybe for whatever reason, these, you know, these aren't your medicines, but these are. So I just want to, you know, LSD lasts like 10, 12 hours. That's a big commitment, but mescaline's like seven to nine, maybe, maybe eight to 10. Uh, and mushrooms are more like six to eight. And then MDMA is really just like three or four. Ketamine's one or two. I'm going long to short. The longest obviously is Ibogaine, you know, where it's like one to three days, depending on who you talk to, uh, and what's interesting, uh, Ghoul Dolan, this, this researcher who's looking at neuroplasticity and like a, a critical window being open in neuroplasticity. And what she's mapped out is that the shorter acting medicines like ketamine, MDMA, ketamine only gives a, a one or two day window for neuroplasticity. Psilocybin's about three weeks. Um, LSD is about a month. Ibogaine, open stays open so it seems like the longer the psychedelic activity or action the longer that critical window neuroplasticity window is open so that's really interesting research that i just learned about at the horizons conference in new york so uh, um has relevance for the the integration therapy that follows psychedelic experience and and, and how that is timed and how long um it is is done what you said before, I just had a, a, a comment to what you said about those who came off their antidepressant meds before they, they used the psychedelic. Uh, it is uh, pretty well established that serotonin 2A receptors downregulated as a consequence of chronic uh, conventional antidepressant treatment like SSRIs. That there's going to be fewer of the 5HC2A receptors, so the classical psychedelics don't really work so well, if at all. Uh, but right, and the same thing probably with the cert, right? MDMA has to lock onto the the serotonin transporter, yeah. And those those also downregulate. 
but but I'm surprised to hear how for, for how long had they been off their meds before they they did the MDMA. Well, it was it really varied, and one of the things we're going to do when we have more people is we're going to divide it up by and see like okay, so the people who were only off for like a couple of weeks is it you know they really had muted, but the people who were off you know for months maybe they did better. We will have to look at that because it was a it wasn't uniform at all, and and you know we just need more numbers to have the power to show where the cutoff is. But that's uh, two. To be determined. It's a chronic, like, you'd be uh, scary, yeah, but also yeah, sure. if it has a chronic effect. Uh, like, uh, yeah. But those who take in depressed medication yeah. that won't be able to, there's a, there's a risk that there's going to be a chronic uh, lack of responsiveness to psychedelic, classical psychedelics or MDMA. Uh, so my yeah. thinking is. Uh, you know, that there may be some people who don't really respond very well to MDMA or who don't respond to psilocybin, but you'll respond to something, right? You'll respond to ketamine or you'll respond to, to mescaline, San Pedro or something like that. So I, you know, I don't think, I think that eventually if you try enough things, something is going to work when the other things don't. I mean, even, even Ibogaine, which really has completely different pharmacology from all the other drugs we're talking about, right? So I just, uh, there's something for you. You know, if you want this kind of experience, my assumption is that there will be some medicine that will work. On the other hand, right now we are saying, if you have a chronic psychotic illness, don't. You know, there may be a time when that advice changes, but right now, like all the medical, all the medical research, we don't allow people with schizophrenia or with bipolar disorder with psychosis or major depression with psychosis like those people aren't allowed in the studies now yet that might change mm -hmm. um you know we wanted to talk about something i know we had mentioned ahead of time just just to sort of um delineate between rec the recreational model and the medical model and you know the thing i've been saying since 1985 is that uh recreation is therapeutic I don't think that we have to, you know, separate off like the medical model is therapeutic and the recreational model isn't. I think we all, many of us who have had recreational experiences, found them therapeutic. Uh, we figured out things. We made some changes in our behavior. So, you know, I think it's safe to say. And the truth is, even without the drugs, recreation is therapeutic, right? Like that puts you in the parasympathetic state if you're in a state of play. So therefore, it's reparative for your body. So just being able to recreate and play in any form is therapeutic, but it is safer in the medical model because you know what you're getting. Can, can uh, I? Just yes. Uh, I just I had, I had a client who had uh, anorexia, uh, and, and she uh, had a recreational experience with MDMA, and, and 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 the way she was able to, you know, be herself, feel her own feelings feel the vibe of the other people. It was really therapeutic uh, from her. But then, then she got into psychiatry again, and then there, were, uh, there was a psychologist who, who was really scared about it. And she shamed her a little of, uh, that she had done it. And then, then all this uh, therapeutic experience, it, 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 it's really closed off for her <laughs> because then it got shameful again that she really had this opening. But but there it wasn't the, the, the here the uh, the therapeutic effect was not so much uh, cognitive rigidity I think it was really this thing about opening up and being yourself and connecting with other people in a social setting and 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 therefore also I, I mentioned sometimes that you know uh, MDMA was called Adam this this uh, this thing about when you take Adam you don't need the the leaf of shame that covers, <laughs> uh, uh, you don't have to hide, you don't have, you, you don't uh, need your mask, you don't need your leaf. But so that would also be a, a, a way to talk about therapeutic effect actually, because this cognitive rigidity uh, uh, thesis is so predominant. I think it's a cognitive, uh, it's, a, it's a thesis uh, or it's a language coming from cognitive psychology, but, but many uh, therapeutic approaches are also about meeting the client uh, creating a safe space where they can really show who they are and, and, and they haven't been met as they are with their feelings before. That is also a basic 
therapeutic effect, I think. You no, know, you're mentioning shame and it's a huge uh, motivator for how people behave. And it's a huge issue, obviously, in psychiatry. Um, and there is a lot of stigma um, with uh, using drugs that are illegal, you know, and it's really too bad that the therapist is, is making her feel bad about, you know, she stumbles on something that's really helpful to her and then she's meant to feel bad about it. It's really, I hate hearing that, you know, there, there's so much uh, shame and stigma are one of the things that drive a lot of our pathology, you know, and if we can, if we can sort of give ourselves a break and accept ourselves and accept our behavior, um, obviously it's it's healthier. We're gonna we're gonna feel better. I, I think uh, we can go to the Q and A in maybe uh, maybe ten minutes or so. But uh, is that would, would it be okay? Sure. Uh, I think uh, yes, and I we are still like sitting here with all a ton our of questions. questions. A ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, you you had one, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, because I'm I'm very interested in this um the, the therapeutic aspects of recreational use, and I, I I know a lot of people combine it with alcohol, and I typically warn people warn people against using alcohol with MDMA, or if they do, to only use modest uh, uh, doses or low doses of alcohol, like one or two units maximum, three. Of course, depending on how long time it goes on, and if they top up the MDMA experience a couple of times with half dose added on every say four hours uh, which is how it is often used um, but one thing that I've heard uh, repeatedly is that without alcohol and the GABAergic effect the sort of benzodiazepine like effect that alcohol can elicit uh, without that some people experience this serotonergic rise and this clarity and the increased vigilance with norepinephrine and dopamine. They experience it as being a, a bit like a sledgehammer, like it's too, it's too direct. And, and especially for people who are, say, uh, traumatized or have difficulties connecting with themselves or shy or there could be a hundred different reasons, but that's something I've heard that it, it's, it can be too intense. And that those units of alcohol can sort of soften the edges of MDMA experience and give a, a softer intro into it and then let the alcohol fade away and just stay with the MDMA experience so that not, not as something needed to, to be present during the entire MDMA experience, but just to get started in a softer way. And as a psychopharmacologist, I'm, I'm like, I know how dangerous alcohol is and how damaging it is. So if you could maybe potentially use a, bench, a bit of a benzo, a quick, faster acting benzodiazepine instead, but. Right, so, I mean, you're bringing up a few things um, that are worth talking about. I mean, I, I don't recommend that people combine MDMA with alcohol, but I often recommend that people start with a lower dose than they may have heard about. You know, the, the sort of classical dose that we had heard about back in the 70s and 80s was 125 milligrams. And a lot of the early MDMA PTSD work that MAPS did was 125 milligrams. But they actually realized that for people who have a significant history of trauma, they do better at like 75 or 80, like significantly lower. And that was a really big surprise. You know, we didn't expect to see that, that that dosage actually worked better in the people who had really significant complex PTSD. So that's one thing. The other thing is that women tend to be more sensitive to MDMA than men. So <clears throat> it may make sense to modify the dose a little bit and, and body weight matters a bit, right? A lot of studies will do it milligram per kilogram as opposed to just, uh, so, you know, in a, if a woman's smaller, but anyway, women tend to be a little bit more sensitive and sometimes get a little bit more psychedelic effect from it than men do. But um, yes, you can use a little bit of benzo. You can also use a little bit of a beta blocker if you're really just trying to get rid of that increased heart rate, the sort of, you know, there's a, with most of the stimulants and even ADD medicines like Adderall or Dexedrine or Ritalin, there is this little coming up period where people feel a little tingly in their head and a little like anticipatory angst, you know, um, and not everyone is comfortable with that. So you can medicate that with benzos or with beta blockers like propranolol. Um, or you could also just have somebody really, you know, do some 
breathing exercises to get them to stay in parasympathetic, right? So in and out through your nose, longer exhales, then inhales. You can plug up your right nostril, just breathe in and out through your left. That will help to calm you down. So, you know, it's nice to give people some other options of ways to calm themselves that that isn't alcohol, but you probably could have like a unit or two if you really needed it. But I feel like it's going to muddy the waters a bit. Maybe it's just a, a simpler approach to uh, if, if a person wants to get to a level of 120 milligrams uh, to break it up into two bits uh, recreationally to do the first half and then say an hour, 45 minutes later to do the, the other half to make it, uh, to not yeah. have it accelerate as much, but to make, make it more gradual. So one of the things that I have heard, and I don't know if this is absolutely going to be the case or not, but it looks like one of the ways that that MAPS may end up packaging MDMA is as 40 milligram tablets. And you can take two 40s at the beginning and then a third 40 about an hour and a half to two hours in. So um, you would end up having 120, but not all at once. Okay. Okay, uh, if, if I can ask uh, a little more uh, therapeutic question also, I want, one of the things that really impressed me um, when I tried MDMA for the first time, as you said, uh, there's this uh, silence in the head, there's this cognitive clarity, and it's so different from the classical psychedelics, and on classical psychedelics or even cannabis, you get this train of thoughts, uh, right. so much meaning making, so much, uh, destabilization of, of your thought patterns and new meaning coming in and streaming in. But here in on MDMA, it's very, very quiet after, after like you had done meditation on something. And then uh, the, 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 the effect, as I experienced, really comes uh, at the bodily level, like the emotional system softens up. Uh, that, that is what how I experienced it as, as really there was this uh, tinkling in the nipples actually you know maybe probably from the oxytocin I don't know but but I, I really got got uh, this feeling of uh, the, the I, I was thinking oh this is not ecstasy this is empathy <laughs> right because uh, it was such a heart opener yeah and it is when I say heart opener of course, I mean the, the heart as the as the place of love and connection, and, and not the physical heart. But but this but it really got this uh, sensation of, of of something melting uh, between the nipples uh, in in the middle of the chest, like wax or something like that, uh, like melting melting away, and and everything softening up, and then the skin uh, the skin getting really warm. And, and that is also a very beautiful effect because I really had this experience like how the skin is also a, an organ of consciousness. Like, yeah. like, like uh, how if your skin is cold and, and, and you are in the sympathetic uh, state, uh, you get, you know, when you are in anxiety, you, it, you, there's this cold feeling in the skin and everything is contracted. And when, right. you, and when you get this uh, in, in, MDMA uh, this is also compared to the post-orgasmic state, right? You get right. this, get this, boom, like this. <laughs> you know, you know. Of course, you know this exactly. This feeling, right? Like, like a warmth, uh, and it really goes to the skin, and 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 when the the skin is warm, you really feel that you are in the parasympathetic state, right? And you feel really that that you can really connect to the uh, social environment really through the skin actually. Uh, can, you, uh, can you recognize this experience or? or yeah, or, I, def I definitely recognize it. I'm, you know, I'm just remembering back, you know, the first time I ever took it, I was alone with, with a notebook and pen, just I wrote like 30 pages front and back and I was really doing a lot of deep self-exploration. But years later, it was more common for me to be uh, either with a bunch of friends at a house party or dancing like at a rave. Um, I went to raves late 80s, early 90s in Philadelphia and then New York. And, you know, I definitely had that flush and that warmth. And I, I also, I felt it was kind of a weird thing to say, but I felt like it made me more beautiful somehow. Like that, that sort of being opened and warm, you know, and having this sort of flush, like, you know, I would look in the mirror and think like, I look better than usual. Mm -hmm. um, but it just like, you know, it was like the beauty was sort of coming out of me. 
Sure. Um, the other thing I want to say about raves, uh, which I've, I know I've said before, but I, you know, it was really an important experience to me is this, is a sense of unity with everyone on the dance floor and feeling like the, everybody dancing was sort of one organism, you mm -hmm. know, that there was this uh, murmuration, you know, like the starlings flying in the sky or something where there was like a group mind, mm -hmm. you know, and like, what a heady experience that group mind is. Um, and I just, you know, I sort of come back to this idea of us being social primates and that it's deeply pleasurable for us to, to feel connected to the tribe. You know, like everyone on the dance floor is sort of in your tribe and you're all together, you know, celebrating as one. That's a, that's a really intense experience that is, you know, I don't know that I would get with psychedelics, you know, I mean, I think that it is something that kind of unique to MDMA to me. And the first time I experienced MDMA, it was actually at a music festival in Portugal. And, and, and when, when I, I, I entered into the MDMA state, uh, it was just so clear that every, everything around me was made for this state, right? All the decorations, uh, everything was made like you, uh, the UV light and everything. It was made like you were supposed to feel under warm water, like you were sort of <laughs> seagrass uh, when you're dancing. Uh, you know, you just, it was just like, it was so uh, visible that this, it was really first when you have taken the MDMA, you were in the inside of the party. Uh, it was It was really like, a, you know, really like a, a mystical cult, like the, the cult of Dionysus in, in, the, in the ancient Greece. It was also, you know, transcending the, the sense of being an skin encapsulated ego and, 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 and merging with the greater body. That was the core of the, these mi mysteries, right? Uh, so I think this is yeah. interesting. We typically talk about MDMA as being an empathogenic substance that you become more empathetic. But what you describe is the the other aspect that it also feels as if the surroundings are also more empathetic, that other people also be uh, perceived as more empathetic. Isn't that also? Uh, well, we know we know from clinical studies that social cues are interpreted with a different slant when people have MDMA on board. You know that they are more likely to interpret social cues as being positive. Uh, you know the if you weren't on MDMA and somebody looked at you a certain way, you'd be like, you know, what's the matter with that guy? Why is he looking at me like that? But when you are on MDMA, you don't interpret it that way. You, uh, it doesn't have the negative valence. So, you know, you, it, I mean, maybe you could say that you misinterpret social cues to some degree, but there is this uh, more, more latitude where you decide you interpret things as being positive for you socially. Um, well, but that well, that ends up making you feel safer, right? And in terms of therapy, you know, somebody's asking in the in the chat about feeling safe before you open up, and you you know you have to feel safe before you open up, and and exploring your trauma puts you in a very vulnerable state. But if you feel safe in that vulnerable state, you can really get some work done. I mean, most of us who do therapy, we know good therapy takes a long time and it is very much one step forward, two steps back over and over again. You start getting closer to something and then people pull away, they disappear. You can't find, they don't come to your office for a while. You know, it, it depends when you're really getting close to something, not everybody is gonna welcome that, you know, the trauma and the revelation and the pain that comes with it. So it, I sometimes the way I think about MDMA assisted therapy is a little bit the way I think about surgery with anesthesia, you know, that the, that the anesthesia allows the surgery to happen. And, and the MDMA really allows that intense digging and reworking to happen that the person actually feels comfortable enough, safe enough, trusting enough, right? Oxytocin is all about trusting and bonding so because the amygdala is quieted down, the fear response is a little bit offline and you, you trust the person enough to open up. I mean, somebody is asking about like which kind of therapy, you know, works best with, with MDMA. And um, I mean, these, these are studies that are definitely going to have to be done, right? Where people are gonna just do CBT or DBT 
or Rogerian or Jungian and, and decide, you know, what, what works best. But um, I think it's safe to say they probably will all work. You know, if somebody is a good therapist and that is the, that's the mode they work in, that will probably be fine. I mean, different patients require different techniques all the time anyway, so. I think Julie, uh, I will ask you one more question and then I'll constrain myself and maybe we can let Morten, uh, 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 let people ask uh, the question live. He can open up for their mic so you can have a little dialogue with them. But I uh, just want to hear uh, right now, there's so much focus on, on MDMA for PCSD, like trauma work. But there's in your book, there's also interesting studies about uh, Asperger's or uh, autism spectrum. That's very, also very interesting, also connected to the, the experience I just described as, you know, taking MDMA at a music festival, because uh, you describe in the book uh, how, how the people who uh, have Asperger's, uh, when they take MDMA, they can pick up this, the unspoken vibe of the social s situation, right? So, so there's something about it's not just about good chemistry, it's also about the good vibes as the Beach Boys factor, right? Yeah. You know, when, you're, when you're on par Paris, uh, sympathetic state, you are so open to, 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 the, uh, to the vibe of the, of the social setting. And, and that can be really hard to, to pick up the vibe or tune into the vibe if you have been traumatized, uh, if you're disconnected because you're traumatized or if you're disconnected because you have some autism spectrum uh, disease. So I think it's find that yeah. very fascinating, actually. Uh, and, and also maybe you can elaborate a little. Do you think that MDMA could be used also for people who have psychosis and hearing voices? I yeah, I really want to talk about that. So um, a lot, you know, when I first came out with the, the ecstasy book and I started, you know, giving talks about ecstasy, I would say to the audience, there's two areas that I really think somebody should do research on. I'm not going to do it. I'm busy, but I think people need to look at MDMA and in autistic spectrum disorders and MDMA and schizophrenia. So Alicia Danforth was somebody who was in an audience, heard me say that, decided she was going to do it. I love that about her. Uh, she went and did an MDMA uh, Asperger study, looking at specifically looking at social anxiety in autistic spectrum disorders, and they had pretty strong data showing that it was helpful. Um, their study came out at the same time as Gould Dolan's octopus study about giving MDMA to octopuses. Um, and that octopus study got, I don't know why, but it got a lot of attention in the media and nobody really paid attention to this very important study of Alicia Danforth giving MDMA to people with autism. So they had good results. There absolutely needs to be more research in this area. And I assume there will be. And now, I am, I am particularly interested in the idea of using MDMA in the treatment of schizophrenia. Um, I wrote a book chapter about it in 2001. Um, recently, finally, after 30 something fucking years of like saying someone should look at this, now uh, at least two groups are starting to do research looking at um, what, I, what I recommended is that they start with people who've got negative symptoms, uh, low motivation, low socialization, see if, if those people get a little bit activated and if they, you know, have fewer negative symptoms. Um, it's not clear exactly what's going to happen to positive symptoms. So this, this, I think the safer way to do a study like this is to start with people who are stable medicated, a lot of negative symptoms, give them a little bit of MDMA, see what happens, um, take it from there. So I, I still think that people who are like actively psychotic or have a lot of positive symptoms, we just need to wait because we, we just don't know. But there were studies by Bert Angrist. My, my guess, is that, uh, if I may just comment on this, because there's also a, a debate at least in Denmark, as to whether you can treat the cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia with stimulant drugs for ADHD. Mm -hmm. That is commercial because they boost dopamine and would that worsen psychosis and stuff. And what I typically say to psychiatrists, if they want to try it out, uh, uh, it is maybe not as controversial to do it in patients who uh, have been stable in terms of positive symptoms for a long time, to, to give a little bit of, of, of stimulant to improve right. the cognitive problems. But I would my guess would be that 
the MDMA is less risky than stimulants because it's more serotonergic. And so, yeah, I yeah, I mean, so there was a, there was a researcher Bert Angrist who gave amphetamine and methamphetamine to people with schizophrenia to see uh, whether it would make their positive symptoms worse, and for the most part, it didn't. Um, so I think it's safe to proceed at just, you know, very small pilot study, maybe non-blinded even, you know, just a very small study and just start to look at this. So, um, I'm in the process of trying to get funding and also study drug, uh, so that we, we can do a small study and start to look at this. So it's, it really, uh, I was just talking to somebody about this this morning that I, it's sort to me, it's like a, a bucket list. So, mm. you know, something that I've wanted to do for many decades that it'll, it'll be very important to me that, that we just look and see, so uh, important. because I think, you know, from the very first time I took MDMA and I experienced that quiet in my head. And I was like, I bet somebody who's psychotic would like this quiet <laughs> for an hour, you know, maybe just a respite, you know, from the noise for a little while. My experience from working in, in, in social psychiatry, uh, of course, there were many people who, who had got that diagnosis because they heard voices, but of, or very often the voices were of the people who, were, who have been um, um, uh, attacking them or molesting them uh, sexually. So it was really trauma. That was really very visible that the voices carried a lot of trauma. So, so if you can do trauma work, Right. With people who uh, it will also be great, and well, and also this thing about that that you get so connected to the body, because uh, I think people who are psychotic in in that area where I work, one of the things they really like was to be sort of you know caressed in in the neck, and when when uh, some of the people did their hair and all this all the things you described in the book, all this caring and bodily. Uh, soothing, touching the skin because they were so dissociated from that body. So, so this body became. Yeah. Also- can I just interject there, Anders? Because I think we we need to to move on to the floor. Uh, but, but, um, yeah, yeah. But I also want to follow up on that because I have a question of my own. So I'm just going to interject here and take the floor. Let people in who have questions, and then you start with yourself, uh, and sure. then I think we should have a dialogue, and we will. Yeah. <laughs> okay, super. So, so um, yeah, touching upon the, the embodiment. So, so in my experience, both as an integration therapist, but also personally, um, besides the psychological perspective, processing trauma is, is in many ways also a journey of, of kind of reconnecting with the body and, and healing a, a split between the mind and the body. And that's potentially a, a very, very long process. And in some instances, maybe a practice for life. Um, first of all, would you agree with that notion? And, um, and your experience is, is the potentially prolonged process part of the narrative within psychedelic therapy right now? Yeah, I think it's something that we're not talking a lot about enough. We're not talking about it enough. You know, I think people who don't really understand this field have this idea that it's like one and done and you'll have one psychedelic experience and you're fixed and you know, it is a process and it is, it is about getting back into your body and getting embodied and working through trauma. And, you know, one thing I wanted to say, Anders, is um, people with schizophrenia have been traumatized. You know, it doesn't have to be, oh, you don't have schizophrenia, you have PTSD. You know, very often it's both, Mm -hmm. right? And people who, who are uh, addicted have often been traumatized, you know, like, I mean, every childhood has some trauma, you know, every, it's all relative. You know, even if you had this amazing childhood where, you know, every single need was looked after, there was still one day where one of your needs, at least, you know, was not met and it was traumatizing for you. So, you know, everyone has trauma that needs to be processed, including people with schizophrenia. So even if it doesn't do anything for the illness, you know, and I think it might, I mean, my, my intuition is that it's, it would at least give an hour or two of respite from some symptoms, you know, and even just that little bit of opening can, can allow a shift in how you interact with your therapist or your family or yourself. Um, Hold on a sec. But so yes, Morton, I definitely, I think that um, it can be a long process to sort of 
reconnect with your body and and de-traumatize you know that way as this slow process of sort of coming coming back in you know especially people who really dissociate you know that that they're the response to their trauma is that they're going to sort of cut themselves off and compartmentalize and numb you know so that the integration is all about decompartmentalizing and denumbing and um, coming, coming to you know the realities of of the trauma, coming to really know and accept what happened to you. Great. I think it's it's so important uh, with that we get a more trauma informed uh, psychiatry, and and MDMA can make a huge difference in that area. It's uh, I think that it's really well going to have a major impact in the short term. That we get a more trauma-informed psychiatry, and it's it's, it's amazing, also potentially amazing. going to connect psychology and psychiatry more than it is at present. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be like a whole new field, really. You know, I mean, I've been thinking of it as like you know transformational medicine or interventional psychiatry, but it is it is its own thing. You know, this like medication-assisted therapy is is a pretty new concept, and you know, ketamine, because ketamine is legal here and people have figured out that they can just prescribe generic ketamine, they don't have to prescribe the $30,000 Spravato. Um, ketamine is getting a lot of people used to the idea uh, of psychedelic assisted therapy, of psychedelic medicine, of neuroplasticity. Um, you know, it's, it's doing a lot of like bushwhacking you know it's sort of it's helping like in terms of like a what like pr like 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 the image you know or like who's doing the branding like ketamine is sort of helping people get used to this idea um that you could take a medicine to make the therapy go deeper that you can have a catalyst for therapy um and a catalyst for change you know a catalyst for neuroplasticity means a catalyst for change so i think um it's just a completely new way of thinking, you know, for both the fields of psychiatry and psychotherapy. And it's, it's really a shift, right? Instead of dampening down the symptoms, you do the exact opposite almost. Like you, you, you make the psychedelic uh, manifest things and, and then you have to integrate, then you have to take care of them. It's really, it's really like turning, turning the philosophy of, of how you use psychopharmacology all the way around almost uh, that's my picture. yeah instead of right and because right now the the model is you take a daily dose of medicines to cover up your symptoms yeah, and, you, and, and you sweep all the trauma under the carpet and you don't care about your lumpy carpet because your medicines make it so that you don't care so um it is it's just a completely you know it's a paradigm shift in the way that we are going to be treating symptoms and trauma. And I can also see when, when I work with clients who have been in psychiatry for a long time, they get used to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, ignoring or repressing everything and everything is interpreted as a symptom of their illness. So right. their, their whole uh, relationship to their own inner life is about avoidance and, <laughs> and repression. And, and right. psychiatry learns them that right they learn yeah. psychiatry. Uh, so that is so important that the psychiatry can start learning them something different <laughs> that absolutely is no i mean it's um sorry it's the word i've been using is like it's it's a disruptive technology it's going to disrupt the field of psychiatry it's mm -hmm. it you know I, I don't like to use the word revolution because it's a little bit aggressive but it, it is going to sort of lead to a revolution in psychiatry because it's a completely new way of doing things but I, I, I feel I have to comment on, on this because we, we tend to like, get so excited about the psychedelic and MDMA assisted therapy that we, we begin to bitch about the conventional uh, psychotropic medicines. But I, you know, when, when I teach what, um, what conventional SSRI or other types of antidepressants do to the mind is that it shifts you to a more positive bias and less focus on, on negativity and pessimism. And that I think is a good ground to build psychotherapy on. So, you know, if you use it in a psychotherapeutic session 
or setting uh, or combine the two, that's what I mean, you can actually get some, uh, there, there's a good um, potential to have the pharmacology assist the psychotherapy, but it's just not the tradition to do so very much. Uh, that's not to say that it's as effective as MDMA or psychedelics, but I just felt like I, I want to nuance on, it's not like they, they only just sweep things under the carpet. They also shift your perspective. <laughs> then I, yeah. In, in Berlin, when we were in Berlin, we were at the Inside Conference, there was this psychiatrist who uh, he did a really moving talk and he had this study where they had a box and they had a had a had a two rats, and one of them were were, were caught in a in a sort of a trap. And when when the normal rats, they the the, the one rat would help the other rat get out of the trap. But when they uh, put the, uh, the 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 helper rat on SSRIs, it wouldn't respond to the the calling of of the rat in the trap. And he said, mm -hmm. "What happens to us?" Society, if everyone is on antidepressants and you can walk walk uh, through uh, homeless people and not having this empathic response, feeling disconnected from the from the suffering, right. that's just I'm just uh, uh, you know poking a little to him because that is <laughs> that's the more critical voice coming there. Yeah, right? no, well, that's I mean that's an important study, absolutely. Um, Caroline is asking a really important question about like. You should we uh, let her ask her in the life, maybe, Morton? Uh, if, if Caroline, you... would you like to ask your question? Otherwise, I'll read it or answer it. Um, I can read it out loud, perhaps. <laughs> if there are like any critical considerations to make for the future, if psychedelics become a legal treatment. Um, yeah. I was just wondering because I've participated in a lot of different um, workshop, workshops or um, yeah, kind of these Zoom meetings where we talk about psychedelics and I'm feeling like that it, it all sounds really good, but, but um, perhaps I'm naive, but, but, and I'm like raised in a, on a, on a school where we like to think critic. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, what are the downsides? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is important. And I, I, so I wanted to get to your question because it's, it's easy to think the way we're all talking about it, that it's all good. And um, the, one of the things that I think is very important to talk about, and that is, that is a negative or something to worry about is that because people are opened and trusting um, and have sort of a, a, a different interpretation of social cues, these people could really be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And um, there, we are all hearing about instances of clinicians who are behaving badly, who are <clears throat> transgressing boundaries, they're having sex with their clients, or they're doing really grossly inappropriate things during sessions. So um, one of the things that I worry about, and I want to you know, I want everybody to be talking about is that there are risks if you're if you're working with someone who is unscrupulous, um, who has poor boundaries, who is not properly trained or properly vetted. <clears throat> that is a big problem. And you know, there are there are a lot of uh, training programs right now for people who want to be psychedelic psychotherapists. And um, some people are going through all sorts of different trainings, but some people aren't going through any training at all, and they're just starting to do underground work. And the more popular it gets, unfortunately, I think the more we're gonna see people who haven't been trained, who are not being safe or are using products that, that haven't been tested or are counterfeit. Um, you know, we're just, we're gonna hear stories of things going wrong um, because there aren't enough safeguards. I mean, this, this is really one of the situations where you're sort of like laying down train tracks after the train has already left the station where we're trying to build something, figure out what the rules are. Um, there's no governing body. You know, if you're, if you're a doctor, you get board certified and if you misbehave, the board punishes you, they take away your license. You have to take exams to prove to the board that you can be a practicing physician. You know, we don't have anything like that with, with psychedelic practitioners. We, there's no governing board. There's no uh, certification process. So these things have to be put in place. Um, so that we can keep things safe, because there are definitely are are real dangers. Um, you know, interpersonal harm happens routinely in psychotherapy. It, it's usually just not major. Um, it can be major, but you know, because these 
these medicines are really catalysts mm -hmm. and they sort of, they make everything bigger and more intense. They really have the potential to make uh, therapy abuse more intense and problematic. So it's really something that we have to talk about. Can I ask a question about that, uh, Julie? Because, you know, what if the, the client uh, needs a hug? Um, what a lot you... of people have been talking about, about touch and consent. Um, you know, touch and consent are a really big deal because yeah, the client very well may need a hug. Most of my clients do need a hug, you know, um, Especially, uh, on MDMA, they really need a hug, right? Or, 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 or sometimes, you know, they, you know, they, you want to sort of pet them or stroke them or that's what they want. I mean, I think the easiest thing to say, but not to do, uh, but, but, you know, everybody has to talk about consent before the drug is ingested. You need to say, um, you know, if, if you, what are we going to agree on? You want to be hugged? Is it okay if I hug you? Are we saying it's okay? Let's write that down, you know, so that we've established, yes, if I ask you for a hug, I want to be hugged. Um, but even then the issue is, you know, people may not consent ahead of time, but then during the session, they want something they didn't realize they wanted, they want to consent, but now they're in this altered state. And, you know, if you really have good boundaries, you really should say, um, you know, we have to go by the list that you and I agreed on before you ingested this drug, right? But there's a whole branch of medical ethics that needs to look at what are the ethics around this therapy? Because yes, some people need to be held, um, but you know, there no sex with clients, like not okay, never okay. It, you know, it, there just has to be like some obvious uh, this is a bridge too far. You can't do this. So, um, you know, I think it's fine to start with a very basic idea that a therapist and a client have an inherent power structure. That means you, that there cannot be any, uh, sexual behavior, sexual touching. It's not appropriate. Uh, yeah. even, even if it's, you know, the next year after your therapy, the rules really are that you're not supposed to have any sort of sexual relationship with your client, period. So, like, can we at least agree on that? But, but also the MAPS model is, of course, with two th therapists. So it's, right. uh, and now the different companies, they want to uh, cost, uh, the cost uh, <laughs> is too expensive. So, uh, so many of them are not willing to pay for two therapies. What do you think of that? I think in MDMA sessions, it's probably a really good idea to have two people that can check that everything is okay and the boundaries and yes, and it's not getting but, too. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the we we now know about two separate events where couples who were therapists and were also a couple. Mm. Uh, had inappropriate relationships with their client, right? That they're so, because, you know, we all assume that this like male female therapy pair, like that's traditionally what has been done and that's what we're all doing. Um, but it turns out that that's not a complete safeguard to their, to their being in inappropriate behavior because it did happen within, you know, uh, therapist pairs who are, uh, you know, we thought that that would be a way to make it safer and it, maybe it is safer, but it's not completely safe without risks. You know, there are still people uh, who are going to cross boundaries that they shouldn't. And, and also I hear from, from underground therapists that it's not just that this thing about sexual touch and, and transgressing, but also just they feel like their clients get overly dependent on them. They really love their therapist extremely much after MDMA therapy. And it can be too much. It can be a sort of uh, uh, dependency almost. That can be, it can be hard to protect their autonomy actually because they are so open in the MDMA experience. That might be also be a worry or, or, or consideration. Because that's also a thing in, in normal uh, psychotherapy. Uh, if yeah. You make your client too dependent on them that, that they can't do without you. But, but in MDMA therapy, all these things might be enhanced or uh, even more uh, extreme. Yeah, well, I think, you know, this is why we're talking about people needing to be trained to go through some sort of training process 
um, to have peer supervision and and to have some sort of you know governing body that makes a determination that somebody has been behaving inappropriately or not. I mean, the, we need a lot of safeguards in place that aren't completely in place yet because it's still just, a, you know, it's still just at a clinical research stage, you know. Um, and there are going to be there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about how this is actually going to be made available to people. You brought up a point of it being very expensive to have two therapists. Um, people are going to want to cut corners. I think one thing that is inevitable is that we're going to have more group experiences because it's cheaper. You can have one or two therapists with a group of eight people, perhaps, mm -hmm. as opposed to two therapists, one client. So I think we're going to end up seeing uh, research to show that group therapy um, is one way to do things. I think especially for like the pre and post, you know, just the the screening and the education that happens beforehand, I think you could certainly do that in a group. Um, although there are issues of confidentiality, so people have to agree. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about S versus R in, you know, in mice versus humans. Um, if Benedict wants to read it. <clears throat> I'm not Benedict, but uh, <laughs> I'm the one who wrote the question. Uh, many of the neurotoxic effects and hypothermic effects of MDMA has been shown to be associated with SMDMA and not RMDMA. So I was just wondering if you think there was any potential in working with pure RMDMA to avoid any of those effects in therapy or, or, or do you need the, the dopamine and no adrenaline from uh, from the SMDMA? Well, I, you know, all the research so far is, is with RACEMIC 5050. So, yeah. you know, what we do know is that that works. Um, I, my gut is my, you know, my intuition is that you really do need that dopamine and norepinephrine just to have the drive to, to dig, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm using digging metaphorically, but it's like if, you know, if you're going to unpack your trauma, it, it's sort of like being on an archaeological dig where you have to dust off some pieces and look at them and figure out what they are and where they fit. And sometimes you really have to dig down. You need like a jackhammer to get down to something. I'm just afraid that if you don't have that sort of stimulation in place, uh, you may not get as much work done, but there has been no clinical research looking at MDMA assisted psychotherapy in humans just using S or just using R. So far, all the clinical research that I know about, uh, especially combining therapy with MDMA is with the, you know, racemic 50-50. And I make a comment to that. My intuition, if now we can talk about intuitions, is that the R and antimere, if that was used purely the effect might lean more towards a psychedelic experience where there would be the client would be less talkative, less energetic, uh, and maybe more sort of inward directed attention, uh, kind of similar to a psilocybin experience or the like, possibly. Time will tell. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I hope that all this research will happen. You know, there's always this issue with research about who's going to pay for it. Um, you know, this is not government sponsored research. So it's either going to happen from a company that wants to develop a proprietary blend. Um, I just, I don't know how else these studies will even happen. So is there no concern about neurotoxic, neurotoxicity uh, with MDMA with those? Oh, I wouldn't say there's no concern, but I would say that you know, at least here in the United States that, you know, our, our Food and Drug Administration, the FDA has agreed when they look at the risk benefit analysis of, of how damaging is, is it to have two or three sessions uh, versus what do the patients get, that, that they think that that's a reasonable risk, that there's not so much neurotoxicity. I mean, first of all, in the medical model, you're not really getting hyperthermia, right? I mean, the person is sitting comfortably talking to the therapist, they may have a glass of water, they're not over hydrating, which is a huge risk with recreational use, mm -hmm. and they're not overheating, right? So you don't have to worry about that. And there, 
you know, whatever neurotoxicity people are seeing in the recreational model or in these hyperthermic animal models, we're not really seeing anything in the, in the clinical medical model that we're using for the research. Um, a new study that's coming out, just, just getting underway um, with uh, Rachel Yehuda, is looking at two sessions versus three sessions because some of the research was done with two, some was done with three. Um, and you, we may even have people who really only need one session. So then there's just no appreciable issue with neurotoxicity or hyperthermia. I mean, they're just, um, those issues are much more uh, relevant to the recreational model than the medical model, basically. Okay, Morten, uh, do we have more uh, questions in the chat or? Yes, I think we have one question from uh, Christopher Lurke. Do you want to post the question yourself? Or should I read aloud? Well, I actually think she uh, she answered it earlier. I did try to. Oh, you know, one, one other thing, though, about combining MDMA with therapies that we didn't talk about, we mentioned like cognitive behavior therapy or dialectic behavior therapy. Um, I think you can also really combine it with hypnotherapy really effectively. And um, maybe uh, EMDR, the eye movement or tapping. I mean, I think uh, this lots and lots of options for combining MDMA with all sorts of different kinds of therapies just to make it work better, faster, things go deeper, be more efficient. Um, most therapies, I think, can probably be combined. Great. And uh, more questions, Morten? Not that I can see in the chat now. I think, Julie, you've been, you have an uh, alert eye all the while you're, we're talking as well, so. That's good. good job. Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, I want to go outside and play. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's been a very informing and very pleasant talk. So I think uh, you should be allowed to go out and play. <laughs> to, to it's sunny. It's sunny outside. <laughs> and you have to do all the great things that you recommend in the book, right? Right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> going out of the basement and, and unplugging and going out to the sun and, and having a little fun. But it's been really, really inspiring. And uh, of course, we still, Jesper and I could ask questions all night and you, yes. would, ne and you would never get out and play. But, uh, but you, uh, you, when I wrote to you, you even said, uh, when are you going to in invite me to Copenhagen? Right. So if, you, if you're still up to that, uh that'll be really a pleasure uh we can talk about when it could be but it would be we would love to have a a lecture that can really we can invite uh, some of the danish health professionals that are, that are right now they're only really discovering what mdma assisted therapy is it is this is a kind of a new thing in Denmark. They they are quite ahead of us actually in Norway. They have quite a lot of maps studies in Norway, so uh, we have things going on quite nearby, but but not really in Denmark. It's it's it's, it's mostly psilocybin research and only a little clinical research, but uh, I think it will be coming in the coming years. But thing people have to get some idea of what it is and and what it can be used for and i think it's very great that we also discussed today also that it, it's not only for ptsd that is of for political reasons and and strategic reasons that is what it has been focused on but exactly uh, uh, when i when i talked to rick in, in 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 berlin he also said ptsd is only the beginning it's, it's only like opening the doors and then we are set to go and there will be so many applications so many models so many therapy models group sessions cop also one thing we hadn't talked about couples therapy <laughs> right really interesting work with couples absolutely yes and 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 maps is doing great work with this called joint therapy where with as ptsd and then the wife or who, who is uh, and so they do, uh, you do uh, couples therapy and trauma work 
in one. But but there is a thing about couples therapy actually that that is not a diagnosis. It's not a clinical indication. So so. I don't know, how, how do you see when will the couples therapy? Well, I mean, you know, the conjoint study, one member of the dyad has PTSD. So there's one diagnosis for the couple, but it's true that, you know, this whole issue of if we're going to get insurance to pay for it, you have to have a diagnosis. Yeah. I mean, that's just the dumb way that we do medicine here. Yeah. Um, and people are, you know, there are new diagnoses, like, uh, like, we just have a new psychiatric diagnosis now that if you're, if you're grieving and mourning somebody who's dead for more than a year, now you have a diagnosis. So that's another opportunity, you know, MDMA assisted therapy for grief counseling. Yeah. But, Complicated uh, grief. So but, yeah, it's true that couples that it, just in a couple that wants to function better, there's not always a diagnosis, but you know, you can just use the diagnosis of like adjustment disorder with mixed emotional features and that covers something. But, but, but it, right before it was uh, made illegal, it was very popular to use as a couple therapy. And, and I think the more press there is around MDMA, the more couples who want to do it. So there will be, a, true. There'll be a booming mark, underground market for couples. I agree. Yeah. Um, how, how do we implement that in a legal and safe manner that, that's an open question i think there's a lot of questions for how we're going to implement things and you know what is it going to look like are you going to go to like a mental health club the way that you would go to a health club and they'll be you know instead of the exercise equipment you've got different therapists offering different plant medicines and fungi cacti who knows i i can't i mean i'm not i'm not an imaginator like i'm not very creative that way so i don't I don't know how it's going to go. I know it's going to be complicated. I know that there are going to be some uh, inevitable bad outcomes, bad stories, you know, bad actors. That's something I do know. Uh, but the potential for good, the potential for healing um, with individuals, couples, family, um, death work, you know, coming to terms with your inevitable demise, uh, sort of psychedelic hospice, that sort of thing. It's a lot of different opportunities and options Julie, can I ask, great can I ask, time to be a psychiatrist yeah <laughs> now that you brought up the couples therapy julie there was a sentence in your chapter on uh, connection to the partner that i i didn't quite understand and i wanted to ask you that uh what if you can elaborate on i know we already said that we'd let you go so this will be probably the last question and you wrote somewhere in the chapter that so pay attention to how anxious or relaxed you are in the prospect of attachment it's vital information in moving towards oneness. So I didn't quite get what you meant with that. Right. Well, because, you know, we, we assume that everybody wants to be attached, right? You make this assumption that like uh, when you're attached, that's, that's the goal, right? If you have secure attachment, that's the goal. But the truth is that some people don't want to be attached. The idea of being attached right. um, scares them and and it comes back to this idea like you know the rugged american you do it you're you know uh, like my first words that i put together after mama papa whatever was i do myself i do myself i was pushing people away i knew i could count on myself i didn't want any help i didn't want to attach you know so i am sensitive to you know everybody has a different tolerance for intimacy some people like, you know, full on enmeshment and other people, you know, they want a space between and the bigger the space, the more comfortable they are. So that's really what I'm getting at is in any dyad, you don't, you're not always match. I mean, people talk about mismatch libido a lot, right? Like one person wants to have sex and the other person's not interested and mismatch libido is very common in, in dyads, but so is a mismatch comfort with attachment, you know? So you can't always assume that everybody wants to be uh, as enmeshed or attached as you want to be. And, and actually also when I work these, these, these things with my clients, you know, a, a, a good connection is also about establishing good boundaries and being able to regulate your own boundaries. So that, I see that a lot uh, when, the, when the boundaries of people are not really well regulated, the, their connection or their attachment gets so messy. <laughs> so, so really, uh, that's also maybe uh, worth re remembering that, that this being able to regulate your own boundaries 
and connecting. They're really two sides of the same coin, I would think, uh, that have to work together or something like that. And, you know, sometimes also our need for attachment will, I mean, like, for instance, as, as a cycling woman, there may be, I, maybe mid-cycle, I really want to attach. And then right before my period, I need a lot of space around me. So, you know, it's, it, it's not simple. It's, I mean, I know people talk about, you know, you have an attachment style, you know, you're either have anxious attachment or avoidant or ambivalent, or, you know, but I don't think it's so, I think it can change. It can shift. Also, like if you're in a relationship with somebody, you know, sometimes you're the pursuer and you're chasing them and they're running away because they want this much space. And then sometimes they turn around and they're chasing you. Um, it's not always going to be the same thing. That's what makes it fun. Yeah. Thank you. So speaking of uh, healthy boundaries, maybe it's time we let Julie go. Got on play. I like the segue. <laughs> yeah. Julie, have you have you seen the chat? Uh, because a lot of people are thanking you right now. So yeah. I'll open just... it up again. Okay. Everyone, you're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, yeah, my latest book is Good Chemistry, and it comes out in paperback this summer, so you can get a cheaper copy. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Uh, but 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 thank you, and uh, we hope to hear from you again, either online or uh, here. We'd love to uh, get you out and play a little in Copenhagen. It's also a fun place to get out in the sun and play if you come this summer. And uh, of course, it would be great to have you here just to, uh, I mean, a Zoom meeting is good for introduction for the themes, but a real event is something else. So Yeah, well, maybe either this summer or next summer, yeah. I would say. We're looking forward to it. All Thank right. you. Julie. All yeah. right. Bye, you guys. Have a nice time. Bye. Thanks.